So, so this video is going to discuss uh, the overview of the theory of confidence intervals for proportion. How do we come up with a confidence interval? And what is a confidence interval? All right. And we'll finish up with an example. All right. So let's suppose you say to somebody, you've heard somebody says to you, I'm pretty sure I'll be at your house around 7 o'clock, give or take 10 minutes. So what that really means is when you add and subtract 10 minutes from 7 o'clock, you're pretty sure that you know you're going to be at somebody's house between 650 and 710. This interval, 650 to 710, is a confidence interval. What is a confidence interval? It's a range of values you believe captures the truth with a certain degree of confidence. So in your case, you believe you're going to be there. Now, how did you get that? Well, basically, you started with a best guess, and that best guess was 7 p.m. Right? And then what you did is you gave yourself a little leeway or cushion, 10 minutes, because you know you're probably not going to be exactly there at 7 o'clock. But how did you come up with your best guess? Well, you knew what time you were getting off work. You probably know a lot about the traffic patterns and so on and so forth. And then gave yourself a little leeway based on that. So in statistics, when we come up with a confidence interval, we basically do this exact same thing except that our best guess is a little bit better than a best guess. Our best guess is when we take a sample. Obviously taking a sample correctly. Now since we're dealing with yes-no traits, that's going to be p hat, right? And then how do we come up with our leeway? Sorry, that's a w. Well, that's where the theory of statistics comes into play. So let's talk about how do we come up with this leeway in statistics. So let's go back to chapter, uh, chapter where we learned sampling distributions. And if you recall, when we looked at the distribution of sample proportions, how do samples behave? Well, we knew that given the truth and we knew a, a certain sample size, we could say that our samples, right, our p-hats, as long as conditions were met, our sample proportions would pile up around P in a normal distribution and spread out by this formula, square root of P, 1 minus P over N. So we knew how samples behave. And specifically, if we looked, for example, we knew that, what, 95% of all samples will be within two standard deviations of what? P, the mean. Oh, I'm sorry, not, oh, not P hat. P, the mean, or the truth, right? Where your samples are your P hats, right? Okay. So how does that help us come up with our leeway? Well, here's the idea. We're looking at it from a certain point of view where we say 95% of the samples, or the P hats, are within two standard deviations of P, but Let's take a look. Suppose the truth, let's call that a person, let's say John, and let's say Carlos is a specific p hat. And let's say these two gentlemen are two feet from each other. So let's say Carlos is a sample, and that sample is two feet, or the idea is two standard deviations from John. Well, how far is John from Carlos? The same distance. It doesn't. They're basically the same distance away. The only difference is perspective. Are you looking from P to a P hat, or are you looking from a P hat to a P? So the idea is this. Given my samples, even if I don't know where the truth is, when I take a sample, if I go out two standard deviations from my sample, then I should capture the truth how often? 95% of the time. So 95 out of 100 samples, or p-hats, will capture p within, what, going out two standard deviations from, from my sample. Now that's as long as conditions are met. And so it seems very simple, but it is a basic truth. So in general, then, what we say is we have to firm this up just a tad bit. So this is true, theoretically. But this is when we know standard deviation, and standard deviation is based on P, 
so how do we, we don't know P. P is the thing we're trying to estimate. So how do we, what, what do we do? We use something called the standard error of, where we replace P with P hat. We estimate it. Okay. Now why can we do that? Well, we just said that really these sample proportions are actually very close to the mean P, so they're very good estimators. And they do indeed turn out to be that. If you wanted to check, you could. You could do a calculation with P and then do another, another one with a P hat, and you'd see they're very close. So this is the standard error. So we use the standard error to estimate the standard deviation. And then we need to talk about the confidence level. So if we know that 95% of all samples are within two standard deviations of the mean, that's the actual theory. So the idea is if I take a sample and I go out two standard deviations, or in our case standard errors in both directions, we're going to capture the truth about 95% of the time. If we were to go out one standard deviation, we would capture the truth about 68% of the time. Three standard deviations, we would capture the truth about 99.7% of the time. So really these are multipliers, and we already have some multipliers preset. We've already figured them out for you, but let me just show you where they come from. Suppose you look at 95%. We've been saying two standard deviations when technically it's 1.96. So where does that come from? Well, the idea is, remember, when we talked about the theory here, P, and we said 95% of all the samples are within two standard deviations, that means the middle 95%, so if we take 95% and divide it by 2, that's 47.5% here, 47.5% here, or really what we're talking about is this 95%, we have 5% missing, which is 2.5% here and 2.5% here. That's outside of this middle 95%. So if we do inv norm of 0.025, you're going to get negative 1.96. That's the z-score. So that's going to tell me the position here for where the, I have 2.5% area to my left, and if I did inv norm of 0.975, I'd get the positive 1.96 standard deviation. It's a z-score. Right. And that's the area to the left of this, right? So that's how they're coming up with this. And you can do that with all of these. You know, figure out what's missing, split it by dividing by 2, and figure out the, the inf norm for that. So now, how do we put all of this together? Well, putting all of this together, what we would get is, to, ca to calculate a confidence interval, we would say, start with your best guess, which is your sample, add or subtract leeway, which would be what we call the margin of error. So you start out with a sample, then you add or subtract a margin of error. In our case, the margin of error is going to be a certain number, that's my z multiplier, of standard errors. Because remember, if I go out about two standard errors, it's 95%, one standard error, like 68. So it depends on how many standard errors you want to go out. So here then, if we fill everything in, okay, so this is your basic formula to compute a confidence interval. So let's go ahead and um, calculate a confidence interval. All right. Suppose I ask 150 randomly chosen adults if they are coffee drinkers, and we're just going to use the definition of drinking at least two six-ounce cups of coffee a day. I find that 60 adults say that they are coffee drinkers in my sample. So well, let's find a confidence interval for this, and we'll go ahead and compute that. So what do we have here? We have the trait is coffee drinkers. So you either are a coffee drinker or not. All right, so yes, no trait. So we're going to use a, a percent or a proportion of, to measure that. The population is just adults. Right. 150 is my sample size. And then this uh, 60 is really going to be the number of people who have the trait. But that's not going to be labeled by, with anything yet, right? So my p hat is going to be 60 out of 150, or 40%. Okay. And so now let's go ahead and 
suppose we're going to do a 98% confidence interval. And usually in the problem, they will tell you what confidence level you want. So I look up my Z multiplier, 98% is 2.326 Z multiplier. So I'm going to have Z equals 2.326. And now let's figure out our standard error, which is square root of P hat times 1 minus P hat over N. In our case, that's square root of 0.4, 1 minus 0.4 over 150. And that turns out to be, now let me just show you, you, you want to put this in just like you would in general. Square root, 0.4, 1 minus 0.4, divided by 150, and we get 0.04. Okay. So this is 0.04. Now let's go ahead and put all that together. We're going to say p hat plus or minus z times the standard error of the sample proportions. So this is 40% plus or minus the 2.326 right, times 0.04. All right. So now, let me show you a what I consider to be an easier way to do this. Now, what you do is you put in the 0.4, and then I usually do the low side, the minus side first, but you don't have to. Minus 2.326 times 0.04. Okay. Now press enter to get your first answer. That's 30, let's say 30.7. Okay. Now here's the key. You want to press second, enter, because that's going to give you the entry. So I'm going to press second, enter, and it recalls the entire line. So now you don't have to rekey everything in again. You just come in here and over strike the minus with a plus, press enter, and there you are, 49.3. So what I got then is 0 0.3072, 0 0.493. So that's say 30.7 to 49.3 percent, or you could say 31 to 49 percent. Okay. So now the way you'd want to interpret that is say this is just one example of a format you could use with a blank confidence between this percent and this percent of the population has the trait. So let's go ahead and fill that in. I would say with a 98% confidence between 31% and 49% of, in this case, our population, remember, was adults. So adults have the trait, and the trait is that they're coffee drinkers. So you'd say are coffee drinkers. Now, I'm going to wrap this up and just mention that a lot of times you're not asked for conditions. But conditions are necessary. Why? Well, the way you came up with the leeway, let's see here, where was I? Leeway. There it was. The way you came up with this margin of error, which was our leeway, is you said, look, I know if I take a sample and I just go out in both directions a certain number of standard errors, I'm going to capture my truth a certain percent of the time. The reason you know that's going to happen is because you understand the theory which says, oh, I know how my samples behave. Even if I don't know where my truth is, the samples still behave the way I know they're supposed to as long as conditions are met. So that if I take a sample and I go out, technically two standard deviations, oops, sorry, that's minus, I'll capture the truth 95% of the time, and then instead of two standard deviations, we're going to use standard errors to estimate the standard deviation. But that's going to be true here, right? I captured the truth, I captured the truth. This is happening 95% of the time. Now, most of the time, you will capture the truth. Sometimes you'll get a sample that creates an interval that doesn't capture the truth, so then you don't. So this here, I captured the truth, I captured the truth, here I didn't. And we never know whether we do or don't capture the truth. All we know that is 95 out of 100 samples will produce intervals that capture the truth as long as conditions are met. So in our case, let's just check to make sure this happens. Here, independence, one adult who drinks coffee won't affect another. Uh, the 10% rule, obviously 150 is less than 10% of all adults. The problem said that the selection of the adults was random. 
And here in our sample, we found that 60 people in our sample drank coffee, that's more than 10, and then the rest, 90, aren't, they didn't drink coffee, or they're not coffee drinkers, so that's more than 10. We've met conditions, so we can say this is how samples would behave, and therefore, if I go out these standardized distances that we figure out through our z-multiplier, right, then we'll capture the truth with a certain degree of confidence. Thanks for listening, and there's my cat.